Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest narration of the web series The Survivor Becomes the Dungeon. If you're new to the series, there is a playlist listed down below in the description. And, as always, I hope that you enjoy. Chapter 107, But Mori Point of View I approach the edge of the clearing of Haven, and the place is abuzz with all sorts of activity. At first, I'm not entirely sure how to approach anyone or where to start. But upon spotting Trisha sitting with Sylvia, Miriam, and Vertissa, I decided to make my way over and check in with them. As I walked closer, Saka bounded over from Vertissa's side, lunging for my legs and using her claws to scale up my wooden body in quick fashion as she perched on my shoulder rather proudly. Hey there, Saka. Nice to see you too, I mused to her, reaching up and gently scratching her chin and throat while she preened and murred at the attention. Sylvia was the first to speak up at my approach as she was regarding me with a small smile. Good afternoon, Vibori. Good to see you. Are you here about your equipment? She asked as she shaped some hide around a curved piece of wood that looked to be about the shape and size of my foot. I moved to sit with them, settling beside Vertissa, and Sackers hopped down from my shoulder, only to get cozy on my lap as she sat there, looking rather comfortable. Uh, not in particular, no, but I would like to see what you've done so far, now that you mention it. Sylvia flashed a bit of a grin as she stood, setting the wood on height to the side. I figured it as much. Uh, I'll be right back. With that, she started for the longhouse. Looking amongst the others while gently scratching the back of Seka's ears, I sensed that Miriam seemed deeply upset, though I couldn't get a clear impression as to why she was in that state. None of the others seemed to be particularly reacting to her being this way, so it's likely not something relatively recent that is her upset. Before I could be nosy and say anything, Trisha piped up as she swallowed a bite of some kind of fruit. So, Vid Murray, what brings you to the haven, if not for your equipment? Well, uh, if I'm being honest, I just needed to be feel useful today, so I wanted to see if there was anything I could do to help out around here, I admitted, though for some odd reason I felt rather embarrassed about it. Maybe it's because I'm an older man, or maybe it's because I finally have a body and hands that can move freely. Sure, I may have built the longhouse all on my own, or gathered all that wood, but that was done quickly through magic. I want to use my hands and do the work somewhere and somehow, perhaps for my own selfish satisfaction. Trisha nodded intently and I could sense she understood what I was feeling in a way. Fair enough, she said simply, offering a bit of a smile before taking another bite of a fruit in her hands. But Tisa was the one to speak up next before the lull could drag on too long. If it's not too much trouble, uh, I actually have something for you to look into if you're up for it, she mentioned as she stirred at the simmering pot of bark and water. With my curiosity sufficiently piqued, I give Vitissa my attention before bobbing my head. Sure, what's going on? I asked simply as I feel Seca start kneading her claws into the cloth of my poncho and my wooden shoulder. Vitissa smiled a bit more, looking towards the tree line. I don't know how much you know, but we've been seeing an increase in spider activity around these parts. We've been finding a lot of webs all over the place, and the traps that Cinco and the others have been setting have been found empty after being clearly triggered and catching something. At first, we thought that it was the one Tehran tracker that Cinco hunted around a week ago, but since then, there have been only more webs and signs of spiders. I nodded intently, considering what I knew about spiders before piping up. Well, I was aware of their nest, and that there were a few spotted on the side of the mountain. But the fact that they're stealing food from traps is a problem. Yeah, don't worry about it. I'll look into it, I say as I offer them a small smile. Trisha looked over at me curiously before deciding to speak up. There's there's a whole, whole, whole nest of spiders around here. Really? Bobbing my head once, I gestured in the general direction of the nest as far as I could recall. Yeah, off in that direction. The size of the nest is about five city blocks, last I checked, and still growing. But the bulk of them are rather far away and on the other side of my mountain. There's supposedly some kind of magic tree in the middle of it all now that I think about it. There don't be more concerned expressions as the woman glanced at each other before Vertissa spoke up once more. But Mori, when you say a city block, how big is that? That took me a moment to consider since I couldn't just give them a reference that I would readily understand. Um, I would say around the size of an average village with fields included. I offer as Sylvia returned, carrying a bundle of things. A spider's nest the size of a village. My gods, are you going to do something about it? Miriam asked, 
but that bit of information getting her to finally speak up as she looked between me and the others. I smiled sheepishly, scratching a little of Mitsaka's throat as she mewled pleasantly. Well, it's not like they were behaving particularly aggressively. As far as we observed, they have only been wrapping their webs around trees and guarding their own territory. But the fact that they're starting to take food out of your traps is worrisome, so I'll definitely check things out. Though at that, I looked over at Sylvia, curiously, and checked out what she had and flashed a bit of a smile. Well, if you're about to go off and fight some of these oversized crawlers, you're going to need something to protect yourself with, even if a bite probably won't affect you all too much. She mused a bit and handed over a bundle. Trisha stood as she finished the last of her fruit. If that's the case, I've got some throwing knives and a dagger ready for you. I hope it'll be enough for now, she expressed with some concern, wiping her hands on her pants before jogging off towards my mountain. It was at that moment that I realized that they were expecting me to head out right now. So much for helping around Haven or talking with Zacita. I looked over things Sylvia had brought me and smiled to myself. Wow, this really is well made. The clothes were hand-stitched, but the needlework was tight and well done overall. This was the effort of several days of work, and I could feel the skill that was put into it. As for the armor, it looked almost like a gambeson at first, but once I picked it up, I could feel the metal plates that were sewn between the layers of the thick cloth. It almost reminded me of a bulletproof vest if I had to find something to compare it to. But it was made of the shape of a coat, though at the end of the day, what I was most excited about were the pants. I could finally get out of this oversized skirt slash wrap and move normally without having to constantly worry that it was going to fall down in front of someone. As I'm looking things over, I realize Miriam and Sylvia seem to be watching me rather expectantly. I suppose I ought to put this on then, I say simply, standing as Seca popped down from my shoulder and rejoined Vitissa's side. Looking around for a moment, I'm not entirely sure where to go to get changed. I may not have anything to conceal under the skirt, but the idea of me being naked in front of this woman, despite being a glorified mannequin, doesn't quite sit right with me. After taking another moment to think about it, I opted just across the tree line. Once I was out of the direct line of sight, I opted to further ensure that I had my privacy, as I poured out some dirt and stone before shaping them into some sort of impromptu changing room. Despite having never worn these clothes before, in the act of getting dressed in something that wasn't just a poncho or a glorified skirt to tell felt so comforting. Even as I used to cut a rope of improvised belt to ensure my new pants stayed in place. For just a moment, I felt more human than I had in quite a time. Holding the long-sleeved green tunic, I'm satisfied to find that there was enough freedom of movement that my clothes shouldn't hinder me in the day-to-day. -day. I was still lacking in the shoe department, however. Seeing as I'm made of wood, I probably don't need shoes to travel, but it's not like I've been wearing any to begin with. I'll probably just try to buy some from a shop of some kind instead of letting Sylvia try to go out of her way to make some for me. Looking over the black armored coat, I go about putting it on as well, fastening the buttons until they're properly closed up. Just going through the motions of putting on armor felt rather nostalgic, even if it wasn't like any armor I was used to wearing back home. Now, wearing it, I could appreciate the considerations that were taken when designing it. There were quite a few plates that were sewn into key places around my body, guarding my forearms and upper arms, around my shoulders, and even some that were shaped to fit around the collar of the coat, protecting what would be the nape of my neck and clavicle. Beyond those, I could feel plates spread out evenly along my chest, stomach, and back. All in all, it was a weighty piece of kit, but not at all cumbersome as far as I could tell. In practice, the plate should protect me from most kinds of slashing attacks, while the sheer padding of the coat would be useful for shrugging off blood strikes. It is also likely to be fairly warm with all these layers, though I have a feeling I probably don't have to worry about exposure while using this wooden body of mine. With the need for privacy done and over with, I pulled the walls of stone and dirt back into my storage, along with the cloth of my skirt and the poncho, before making my way back to Haven Clearing. Though, before I could say a thing, Sylvia and Miriam both approached and started looking me over, making me bend this way and that, and move in specific poses to test the range of movement that I could accomplish while wearing the things they made. After a few minutes of this, Sylvia spoke up with a rather pleased smile on her face. You certainly cut an impressive figure of it, body. Is there anything you want us to fix? She asked rather sincerely, as she looked me over from shoulder to shoulder. I couldn't help but grin in response as I shook my head. 
Nothing I can think of, no. This is some wonderful work, I enthused cheerfully before glancing at my own feet and continuing. You also don't have to worry about making me shoes or gloves. I don't need either right now, I mentioned while looking between them. I owe you both. Is there anything you would like for me to do for you, either of you? Anything at all? Miriam looked taken aback with surprise, while Servia looked thoughtful. The two women glanced at each other for more than a few moments when Miriam piped up first. I... I'm not sure what I could ask for. Is it alright if I take some time to think about it? She asked, her voice clear with an air of uncertainty right now. Sylvia smiled as she started walking back over to the sitting area around the boiling pot. I'll also hold on to the debt of yours for later. It's not every day a dungeon says they owe you after all. She mused rather teasingly while collecting her tools and materials before stashing them away. I bobbed my head at their decision. Sure, there's no time limit on cashing in these debts. Just let me know when you've got something in mind. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll see about dealing with that spider problem. Good hunting, Vitmari, Vitissa said and held up a large wooden spoon in declaration, Seka morowling at her support as I made my way out of Haven's clearing. Instead of making my way straight to the spider's nest, I start making an ascent up the mountain to meet with Trisha. Through our bond, I made sure to let her know that I was going to meet her soon so she didn't have to rush back down the mountain for no good reason. When I finally do make it to the smithy, I find Trisha in the storeroom as she methodically polishes something with a piece of cloth. Hey, uh, sorry about making you feel like you had to rush up the mountain. I appreciate you going through the trouble, though, I offer. Though she still jumps slightly, as I sensed I startled her by speaking up suddenly. Apparently, she didn't hear me come in. She looked back over at me and flashed a small smile, turning to face me while hiding whatever it was she had been polishing behind her back. Hey boss, sir, don't worry about it. I just wasn't planning on you needing your weapon so soon. Your sword still needs a hilt and sharpening, and I haven't even gotten started on your spear yet. Despite her concerns and somewhat self-inflicted sense of pressure, she still seemed rather proud and even excited about what was to come next. I couldn't help but be at least a little swayed by her good mood, as I smiled back and stepped closer, crossing through the store's room's threshold and waiting to see what she'd been hiding. It hasn't been all that long since you started, so be sure to take your time. Honestly, I'll be happy with whatever you can make for me after my own piss-poor attempts at smithing using magic. I mused almost mischievously at the end before shutting up so that she could finish hyping herself up. After another moment, she pulled out a cloth-wrapped bundle from behind her back and held it in her palms of both of her hands. I want to say that this is my best PC yet, though I'd be lying since I am still working on your sword and spear, she mused confidently. I could sense that she was genuine in her confidence, which was quite a good sign. When she offered up the bundle, I took it up and immediately felt the hilt was heavier than the blade and smiled again. It dawns on me that I didn't even tell you what I intend on using the dagger for. I mentioned offhandedly as I unwrapped it, revealing a wicked-looking double-edged dagger that had been sharpened to a point. The blade was quite beautiful, shade of metallic mint green, whereas the thin hilt was rather dense piece of black metal with a compact card. At that comment, I sensed a spike of worry shooting from Trisha as she suddenly looked a little less confident. Is, is there something wrong with it? I can remake it, no problem. I chuckled softly as I shook my head taking up the dagger by the hilt and holding it securely in my hand as I got a feel for it. No need. It's perfect. This dagger was made for stabbing and making a mess. It was just what I needed. Trisha seemed to shudder at that comment, and I can feel a healthy mix of fear, awe, and pride at how I described her work. Ultimately, she settled on pride as she flashed a toothy grin and scratched the back of her head. Thanks, boss. I honestly wasn't sure about it at first. I had only seen a brain like this before and was hoping for the best when I settled on a design. Now, that was a surprise. I glanced between her and the dagger again before chuckling a bit. If that's the case, I'm even more impressed. There was this contest where they would gather blacksmiths from around the nation, and they would put them against each other, raising to make a certain blade shown to them by the judges. For all their tools and machines that sped up the process and made things much easier, they would still fail to do real right with the example in front of them. I then held the dagger up, letting it catch on the light with the self-sustaining ball of light that illuminated the room. Yet here you are. You may have had the advantage of getting to work it a little longer. 
But you beautifully recreated a blade from memory that you no doubt only looked at quite some time ago and undoubtedly improved on the design to what you thought best. Trisha was all sorts of shades of red from the praise as she sheepishly scratched the back of her head. A smile nearly glued to her face as she looked up at me. I only did my best and nothing more, boss. She was not sure what else to say, but I could sense she was fired up as she then procured a set of brown throwing knives that were bound together by a cord and pressed them into my free hand. Now if you excuse me, I've got work to do, she said, very bluntly trying to force her way out of the conversation before she seemingly embarrassed herself in front of me. I eagerly held up the throwing knives as well, marveling at how balanced and sharp they were. But before I could say a word about them, Trisha had already hurried off towards the smithy without another word. Well then, I suppose they ought to get to work. End of chapter. I would just quickly like to thank the T5 peeps. Dragon Soup, Cold War Boomerwaffen, Severin Cerberus, Red Panda 121, Leslie 517, Bushmaster 177, Casper Arnold, Cam Maxwell, Sans the Skeleton, Lightjock, Dragzoon WRE, and Lord Azrakal. Thank you very much.